Welcome back to the VIP Collective. I'm your host, Karim McDonald, and today we have another new topic for you as we are welcoming Mary Morano, who is a psychotherapist and relationship expert with life and family counseling. Mary has been featured on CTV, Your Morning Show, and also News Talk 960 AM. Now today we're gonna to talk about family dynamics when it comes to wedding planning. As we all know, everybody's situation is a little bit different, but today Mary is gonna leave us with some tips on how to navigate through working with your family members during such a stressful time. As always, if you like this episode, please feel free to hit like, subscribe, and tap the bell. Now if you're ready, let's go. Welcome back to the VIP Collective. I am your host, Karib McDonald, and today we are sitting with a brand new face to the podcast. I'm excited to welcome Mary Morano. She is the relation, relationship expert of life and family counseling. Hello, Mary. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited. This is very exciting. So the podcast has been operational for almost two years now, and we have talked a lot about weddings, obviously. And as we start to, as I start to kind of deep dive even more into topics and what we can bring to the audience. And when I came across you and you have an extensive background, I know you've been featured on CTV and you've also been on radio and you are morning show. And so you have the experience and I have listened and found you on Instagram. I've been listening to uh, some of the talks that you give on there. And I think you are just full of a lot of information that would be super helpful for our audience who are now engaged, getting married, or even business owners who have partners who are trying to navigate their own relationship during a pandemic, especially. So I'm excited to have you on the podcast and I wanna thank you for your time to come in and sit down and talk a little bit about how people can navigate their relationships with family members, with their partners, especially during wedding planning because the stress is the stresses are there. So it's, really, yeah. So I think it's really an important topic and I'm so happy that we were able to connect. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you. So before we even get into it, if you want to give just a little bit of a background about yourself and how many years you've been doing this and uh, how we got to where you are today. Yes. So um, I have been in the social service sector for probably, I'm going to age myself over 30 years, uh, working with children and families and individuals. And I've been in private practice for the last 10 years. Um, and that's sort of where the inception of life and family counseling came from. I used to be sort of everybody's, you know, best kept secret in, you know, working from my basement. And then my home office got really, really busy. And um, my family started to grow, so I had to sort of move out of there, and that's what we've done over the last, uh, gosh, now I think uh, three years, and we've been in this new location, so it's been very exciting, and you're absolutely right about planning weddings. I think that's the ultimate relationship work. Mm. If you can plan your wedding, and you know, then you know you've got a good, solid relationship going into things if you can get through it unscathed, so it's uh, it's the insight I think you gain in such a time like that, especially like not only just wedding planning, but then we throw the pandemic on top of that. And so, oh. you know, the, the normal stresses of just making the decisions of like who, which vendor maybe do we prefer, or of course the financial aspect of it too, but then to add on the level of should we postpone or should we go through with it? And of course there's family dynamics and it's just, I think for everyone, it's just been a trying time. And I'm sure you've seen that in your practice where new yes. things are coming to the surface, new feelings, new, you know, things you maybe hadn't seen within your partner before and all of a sudden something new comes up. And I'm sure that's something that's kind of come across your plate. <laughs> I can't tell you how many new things have come across <laughs> my plate. Um, they may not be new, they've just sort of morphed into different things. But, you know, think about what happens when we spend a lot more time uh, with each other, you know, um, we've had jobs to go to, we've had actual, you know, that natural space that we have, but what happens when now our workspace is from home and, you know, we're, we're still trying to plan our events or they get postponed. What do we do with all of those uncomfortable feelings? How do we share that information with others? How many suggestions do we get and how many opinions do we get from others? Some are welcome, some may not be so welcome. 
And then how do we navigate through that, um, you know, with whoever that audience is, or even if it's with our partner. So yeah, it does get tricky and challenging, but I also look at them as really great opportunities for you to do that relationship work. Because if you can get through a pandemic and planning a wedding and the postponements, um, you know, it really shows the strength of your commitment and, you know, and our communication. Because remember, we can listen, Mm -hmm. but are we being heard? We can listen, but are we listening with an open mind? So they're two very different things. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. And uh, so what I would like to do is get started by talking about boundaries in a sense. So when I say boundaries, I mean, if you're going to plan your wedding and, you know, it's a, these are decisions you and your fiance want to make together. But of course, there's, like you said, there's other people uh, giving suggestions or giving their own opinions. So if you're newly engaged and you're making the decisions with your fiance, and then of course you have outside chatter as well of people who have opinions and they also have suggestions for you. How do you begin the process of letting your family know that we love you, but this is our decision? Like how do those conversations <laughs> begin? Please help us. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> so we'll start off by, you know, talking about what are boundaries in the first place. Yes. Um, you know, because I think people forget that having boundaries actually keeps us safe in our relationships. Um, boundaries are, you know, or they help us to check in um, with ourselves. And, you know, it's, it's where, where I begin and, you know, the other person ends. So what are my values? What are my limits? What are my needs in my relationships or any particular situation. You know, it's um, how we feel comfortable and how we want others to treat us. So that's really what boundaries are. Okay. So those are personal boundaries. Um, but what happens when we're boundaryless, right? That's the energy where, um, you know, we might be doing things that we know are bad for us, but we do them anyways. Like, avoidance, withdrawal, internalizing those feelings, Mm -hmm. right? Because Mm -hmm. then what happens is we build up with anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. And so to your question about how do we plan, you know, with my fiance to have a wedding that's ours, we all know that weddings are not just ours, unfortunately, unfortunately, but they're family events. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of dynamics that come with weddings, Who's paying for the wedding? Who has a say when we pay for the wedding? A lot of times we know that, you know, in our families that parents may contribute, you know, to the wedding. And what does that mean? It's funny because I actually had a conversation with someone just about this just before we Mm. hopped on. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And I said, don't forget to watch this afterwards. Um, You know, it's going to be really great on boundaries. And, And really, how do we have that conversation with our families? We have to have that with each other first. What are our values around our wedding? I like to say, let's set the intention for our wedding. Mm. And you and your partner, you know, come up with the list of intentions. Do it separately, right? What are yours? What are mine? Could you give some examples? So setting the intention would be, I would like to have um, a fun and, you know, peaceful and connection. Um, These are the energies that I want around, you know, planning my wedding and for the actual day. Love it. Right. Uh, I want us to have open communication during this time. I want us to um, still connect in our relationship as we plan for things. And what happens, you know, also when we don't agree, how are we going to come together? Mm -hmm. Right. So setting those intentions. So when you've got that over here with the two of you, you sort of laid the first, you know, foundation of that. And then, you know, with our families, sharing our intentions. This is our intention for how we'd like to plan our wedding and how we'd like to go into that wedding day. Hmm. I like that. So you're setting it up then essentially when you sit down with them and it's something you've already discussed with your fiance. Yes. And then when your parents say, oh, we want to contribute to your wedding, Mm -hmm. um, you might say, what does that look like? Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like, and, and the funny thing is um, if you think about it, how many 
I, you would know better than I would. I just know from friends and things like that. A lot of us plan our weddings from when we're young children, right? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. This is what my dress is going to look like. And this is what I want, you know, the room to look like. And these are the colors. So you've already got that. So it's like, you know, once you get engaged, you know, people just want to dive right into things and everybody's excited and everybody's got opinions. Uh -huh. Like I said earlier, maybe really strong opinions. And how do we, you know, if we've got a really dominant mother, if we have a dominant mother-in-law, how do we navigate through that? You know, a lot of times I hear, well, we had a great relationship when we were dating, but then the moment we got engaged, things changed, right? Because now it was like, ooh, now how do we negotiate? Or how do we share, I don't like this. Uh -huh. That's not my style. How do we have those conversations that um, aren't mean and hurtful to one another? Right. So does that mean when they do make the plan to sit with their family members, they are talking expectation right off the get go? Is that kind of the first conversation? Well, I think we have to be careful with expectations, right? Because okay. if we have expectations and those expectations aren't met, we're going to be hurt and disappointed. Right. And so, um, having a conversation with our families even before we start planning the wedding might be like, you know, how do you see this going? I know you're contributing to the wedding and I really appreciate that. Or we really appreciate that because parents want, you know, to be recognized and the same way we want to be recognized, um, you know, and this is sort of our thinking around planning the wedding. Okay. Right. And so they kind of know where you're coming from and then they might want to know, well, how can we be included? Right. Especially if they are going to be a part of giving within a part of the budget as well. Absolutely. And then asking, you know, why don't we all write our wish list? Right. This is mm -hmm. our wish list as a couple. Right. And, you know, and this is our budget. This is what we planned for, you know, if we weren't paying for or if you weren't contributing to our budget, this is what we could afford. And this is what we would want. And then, you know, depending on her side, you know, their side, what does that look like? OK, so right. would they also be creating like meetings with each set of parents separately. So maybe we're going to have dinner with your parents tonight and we're going to talk about this. And then we're going to go and have dinner with your parents and we're going to talk about this. And therefore you've kind of set the standard immediately. Well, it depends on, you know, sometimes um, it might be better to, you know, the families meet anyways, right? So we sort of have some rapport. And my hope is that whoever's watching that your families get along, right? Because <laughs> right? it makes it a lot easier, right? Because then, you know, we're having different conversations when families don't get along, right? Um, initially, when we come together and, you know, we sort of have this open dialogue, uh, you know, now we sort of set the stage for um, having that open communication. And, you know, once we have sort of our wish lists, um, you know, I, I know um, in that wish list, let's say I can only afford this, or this is what I like. And, you know, some parents might think, oh my gosh, my friends and my family are coming and that is not enough food. Right. But you're saying, I only want this because it's what I can afford. So if that parent wants to up the budget because they want you know, surf and turf, and you just want something else, mm -hmm. um, you might be able to make that concession. If you're willing to put in the extra for the budget, because I can't afford that, um, then, you know, go right ahead, you get your surf and turf, right? So it's being able to, you know, meet people, um, you know, in that nice sort of place where we can um, at least join each other in the truth or that open dialogue, because it saves a lot of hassle and a lot of, you know, miscommunication or resentful or controlling feelings. Right. So, so we begin with intention then, and mm -hmm. then we move into what about with, again, staying with boundaries. What about if there's certain things that you have had your heart set on, like you said, you know, there's some people who have wanted to get married since they were, you know, four years old. So if they have a certain outlook for the dress 
or, you know, for the design. And of course the parents are contributing and they would like input as well. Are you able to set a boundary or how do you politely set something that says, I understand you're, in, you're contributing, but this is my day. How do you do something right. like that? What's an example of that? So think of, you know, some examples around boundaries are respecting someone else's opinion. Mm -hmm. right? Refraining from criticizing, right? Because I may love this big thing on my shoulder and, you know, my mom might not like it at all. So don't criticize, you know, what someone else's choice would be. Don't make comments about people's weight or the colors that they've, you know, picked, mm -hmm. um, you know, be mindful of not taking out your anger um, on others. You're not allowed to do that. That's what boundaries are, right? Make sure that we're not sort of being sarcastic about things because sometimes that sarcasm, not sometimes, it's just another form of being angry. So we don't actually say directly what we mean, right? And, you know, and, and this can happen very subtly in um, our relationships or as we're planning, right? Um, and that's sort of where when it's our day, and we've planned for certain things, uh, we can say things like, you know, I really appreciate your opinion, but that's not helpful. Okay. Right, okay. so you can have, you know, little statements like that. Um, you know, I know that you're contributing to the wedding, uh, but this is um, a hard boundary for me. Right. So in a sense, you're letting them know with phrases like that, especially a phrase like that, that says, this is not helpful. It's allowing them to hear if they're listening that maybe this opinion wasn't needed, right? Like this is an opinion coming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. think, about, think about those wish lists. What could actually go on them would be, you know, th this is sort of, these are my wants. Everybody can have their wants. And, you know, perhaps being, you know, the couple who's actually getting married, uh, these are the staples and non-negotiables for our wedding. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then parents can be clear, the color is going to be this, this is what, you know, uh, our song is going to be, or, you know, this is, you know, we want like, you know, the floating, you know, champagne thing or whatever it is that they want, you know, that I've wanted that my whole life. Right. So that's not changing. So if someone has a real problem with that, they're going to have to take care of, you know, that feeling on their own. Okay. So we're setting intentions. We're having meetings. We're discussing in a sense, and I say expectations, and I guess, I don't know if that's really the right word, but if a parent is contributing what their expectations are with that contribution, Absolutely. And then creating a non-negotiable to say, this is what in my heart I would like for this day. And mm -hmm. I would love your input outside of these things, essentially. Yeah. And also think about it. If let's say you and your partner want um, a smaller event, but your families, you know, want, you know, hundred of their friends coming and mm. you don't want that mm. you might plan for that event and that venue and say to your parents you know this is the 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 max that we want at the wedding and so we have to keep you know our lists tight mm -hmm. so between both sides you, this is sort of what you have to work with in terms of so all because you know think about it your family and friends um, as a couple are going to include your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your grandparents. So you're not going to have to worry about those, but maybe parents get, you know, uh, 20 of their closest friends. Right, right. Right. Sometimes they may not like all of the things, but that's where we need to make some of those adjustments. And that's why it's important to understand. Um, I know you're contributing. What does that look like? As a couple, right, being able to go to your parents and say, you know, this is what our, you know, um, our vision is for that day. And we'd really like to plan for that between the two of us because we think it would be really great relationship work for us. Right. Okay. So I'm loving these tips so far. And this brings me to 
a question with regards to taking things personally mm. and kind of the next step, which I also want to talk about, which is uncomfortable feelings. But mm. if you are, let's say you're trying on your dress and you know your mother-in-law or your mother says that they criticize the dress, they don't like it, but you love it. How do you, is there any type of way to kind of put up a block so you're not taking it so personally that it, it sticks with you? Well, think about it. This goes back to having those boundaries that we talked about or having, you know, those pre-conversations. I'm already feeling a bit nervous about going dress shopping. So when we're there, I would really appreciate it if, you know, um, you didn't throw a whole bunch of comments at me or you were mindful that, you know, I'm not sure what kind of dress that I like, you know, depending on what kind of relationship you have with, you know, your side and your in-law side, right? You know, some of these conversations may not go very well, uh, or they may go very well if you have a good rapport, right? Um, but kind of letting them know already that I'm a little nervous off the bat and I don't want any criticism. And if I love the dress, then I love the dress. Then zip it. <laughs> zip it. You got it. Right. And my hope is that, you know, people would be mostly respectful of reserving some of their opinions, but sometimes we know that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, this could, this could take us into like 110 right. different conversations right now, yes. uh, but sort of internalizing a person. If you know, you have a mother that's super critical and she's been that way all your life, you have to know that mom doesn't does just doesn't do this with me. She does this with everybody. That's so how come I keep personalizing and internalizing those comments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of it, you know you're gonna buy the dress that you love anyways, regardless. Because mm -hmm. I think we all know when we go shopping or when we try that one on or that you know particular outfit, it, there's an energy and a feeling that comes with it that makes you feel like amazing in it. That's how you know it's the one. Your mom's not wearing it. Your mother-in-law's not wearing it. That's, right? a really, that's a really good point. Yeah. And, and you just kind of, you just know. Mm -hmm. And when you're in it, um, you just know. And you were like, this is the one. Sorry. <laughs> like it or lump it. Right. <laughs> um, you know, you're not, you don't have to necessarily say it that way. But you, with that feeling. And I think people know when, when you try it on and the bride um, has that sort of Glow. moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, everybody just kind of, you know, that energy changes in the room because like, that's the one and we kind of celebrate it. Um, but sometimes that doesn't happen for everybody. And if it doesn't happen with everybody, um, that's where you can, you know, respectfully say like, I appreciate that you may not like the dress, but I love it. Right. And own it. And when you say it, it, you own it. Absolutely. So it's kind of that, um, putting yourself in a position where you can see the other person's point of view, but not take it on as much, which I think is really important. As hard as it is, it's a practice. You definitely have something to practice, but it can be done because the, the less you take things personally, the more peace you have. Do you agree with that statement? 100%. And the thing with boundaries, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of an example. So there's an external boundary, an internal boundary, our functional adult, and our adaptive child is supposed to be standing behind us. Right. If you're internalizing and personalizing things, I want you to question who's in charge right now, my adult or my adaptive child? Mm. Because when we get into conflict or we're personalizing, it's likely that when you got that first uncomfortable swish of emotion, it hit this external boundary. Mm -hmm. This is where you've got to catch that uncomfortable feeling because if it jumps into the internal boundary, this is our emotional regulation muscle. So if this one here has been underdeveloped because you maybe you're a spoiled child or you've been an entitled child growing up, maybe you don't have great relationships with your parents, right? So all of those little tensions make this emotional regulation muscle weak. Mm -hmm. 
So if it jumps in and you don't have a good sense of yourself, you're likely going to operate in your emotional age, not your biological age. Wow. Which would be the inner child standing behind you and the effect that it had as you were a child. So look how far away with those boundaries your inner child needs to be way back there. Wow. That's right? powerful. Mm-hmm. And think about it. If I have an inner child or my adaptive child is there, your mother has one, mm. your mother-in-law has one. Mm. So when things or emotions are flying or tensions are high or people are being reactive, it's likely that they're no longer operating in their adult. They've gone into their adaptive child. That's important to know that everybody can, because everybody can get involved in their own reality, of course, because this is our reality, this is our world. And everybody has exactly what you've just laid out, their emotional body, their inner child. Mm -hmm. And think about other things, you know, even in dress shopping, you know, confidence and, you know, self-esteem, body image. So there's so many things that can impact us um, in those moments. And so that's why, you know, um, I think everybody should go to a little bit of therapy at some point in their life because it just helps us to, you know, be introspective and understand our history and what are those imprints that we have, our own negative core beliefs. Because the more you know yourself or you're in, you know yourself in your partnership, right, you're going to have less conflict. You're not going to internalize those things the same way because you don't need to. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is who I am. And it's okay for me to keep myself safe in these relationships. But boundaries are hard to establish when, you know, they don't teach us those things, right? We have to learn some of those things along the way. Kids know boundaries really well. It's interesting because everybody grows up different. And so everybody has a different system they learn growing up, which you know, down the road ends up being a part of what their, what their knowledge is to this date. And like you said, everybody needs to, or everybody should have therapy at some point just to give you that reflection. Because mm-hmm. I think sometimes it takes a trauma or something significant to all of a sudden catapult you into a reflection phase. Whereas if, you, if you're ahead of the game and you're already doing that work, then it can benefit you in the future. So very, very interesting stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about uncomfortable feelings because it all falls in line with if there's a conversation that you are dreading having and you know, the bottom line is really communication. But if there is that conversation that you just do not want to have because you know, it's going to blow up, it could be very reactionary or it's just going to be uncomfortable. Like how, and what are the steps to work yourself up to that conversation in order for it to be a little bit easier than you might anticipate. Well, welcome to the big leagues when it comes <laughs> to your emotions, right? Um, you know, those negative emotions or perceived negative emotions, right, um, are so important because that's all part of, you know, having a full human experience. Uncomfortable feelings don't have to be bad. Mm -hmm. I actually teach people how to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable until they're comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. (laughs) I know that's a mouthful. (laughs) Say that again. (laughs) Yeah. So, because it's so important because again, we, we, we don't learn how to express our emotions Um, or have those boundaries. So when we have to have those uncomfortable conversations, we start to build up like what that story is going to be in our mind. Mm -hmm. We make assumptions like, oh my gosh, if I say that to that person, they're going to have a reaction. How do you even know that? Right. Right. And when we make assumptions, it's a story of lies. And when we tell ourselves that story of lies, we tell it to ourselves like it's actually true. Mm-hmm. But we have no evidence that tells us that that person's actually going to be upset or they're going to have that reaction, right? And so once we have that conversation, we probably say, I would say 97% of the time, say, oh my God, that wasn't so bad. Right. Right. Or we don't give the person the opportunity to show us a different way or a different part of themselves. 
right? Because I think a lot of times too, it's your brain believes whatever you tell it. So worse. if you're making those assumptions, your brain just assumes that is automatically true. And think about what happens when we start to have those pre-conversations before we plan, yeah. right? It's going to be easier to have those conversations along the way. They're not going to be so daunting because we've done some check-ins, you know, um, we've kept people, you know, involved in the planning. Uh, people know what's going on, right? Yes. So, there, there's going to be less miscommunication. Um, you know, when we have some boundaries, it helps to organize and plan, delegate roles. So everybody sort of knows what they're doing. Um, and then we come back together and we say, okay, let's do a check-in. How are we all doing? Mm -hmm. So if you do that along the way, um, you're going to see that, you know, tempers aren't going to flare uh, because we've had that conversation. What do we do when we don't agree? Yeah. How do we approach each other? Can we set that intention to be kind, loving, respectful, even when we're angry and especially when we're angry? Right. Yes. Not easy to do. <laughs> Not easy to do. And then if you do have that conversation up front, it also allows you to then revert back to that original conversation. You got it. And you can say, we talked about this at the beginning. And then what about taking a breather? What about taking, let's say you're, you're fired up, you're in the living room and everyone's kind of, you know, they've got their own opinions about something. What about just kind of taking a breather? And do you ever recommend people just... Take a moment. All the time. It's <laughs> called a delayed conversation. Oh. Yes, adult timeouts. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. When you are fired up, remember that first swish of emotion? If it jumps over that external air and now we're in that internal regulation muscle area, you are unreasonable. Mm. It doesn't matter who provokes it, you're unreasonable. Because are you in defense mode at that point? Because you feel attacked? Possibly, depending on who's operating. If you're in your adult, you might be able to say, look, I'm stirred up right now. I'm gonna go take an adult timeout and I'm gonna go regroup, functional adult. Adaptive child is not reasonable. So they're going to get defensive, they're going to be reactive, we're going to be yelling and screaming. You cannot reason with somebody who's unreasonable, right. whether it's you or the other person. So having a delayed conversation can actually save any situation. And it doesn't matter, like I said, who starts it. Once you recognize, oh, I got that uncomfortable feeling, let me go take a break, reset, and then I can come back to the situation in my reasonable mind, in my wise mind. And even if the energy is still similar to when you left, your energy would change, which then shifts your own perception of what's happening. Yes. And if you try to re-engage after you've had the time out and you've calmed yourself down, mm -hmm. you said, okay, adaptive child, back there you go. Um, and you go back to the room and people are still not in in a good headspace then end it say okay. i'm gonna go home and i'm gonna we're, we'll talk about this tomorrow sleep on it yeah right it's almost like professional sports right there's this rule that you can't approach your coach until you've sat with it for 24 hours oh, i didn't know that Mm hmm. And so after the 24 hours, your emotions have calmed down. And then you get to decide, is it as important to me right now in this moment that it was yesterday? And likely not so much. Right. Right. And then when you go back to revisit, you're probably going to have a better conversation. Yeah, I think it's energy momentum. Yeah. <laughs> And also think of part of boundaries is taking ownership and responsibility for yourself because it's easy to blame somebody else. You did this. You did that. Mm -hmm. And when we take ownership and responsibility, we bring it back home to ourselves by saying, you know, yesterday I was out of line. 
I overreacted. I shouldn't have yelled and screamed and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm not sorry for how I feel mm -hmm. because my feelings are valid, hurt, disappointed, I'm angry, but I could, I did, I'm not allowed to be angry all over you right? or hurt all over you. So that leads me to this question then. If you're in a relationship and you do want to communicate and you start off by saying, you make me feel this way. You're likely in a fight in the next four seconds. Okay. <laughs> because it can be confusing because you would think you're communicating and I'm telling you how you make me feel, right? But I feel this way when you do this ah. because... So you see the difference? The moment you say, you did this to me, what do you mean I did this to you? Well, you, they're just going to come back at you, right? And now that person's going to be on the attack and going to want to defend it. And, you know, and that's why it's so important to learn how to listen with an open mind. There's a difference, right? There's communication in how we talk, which talking is the best medicine because when there's a problem, the problem solving doesn't happen without the talking, Right. Conflict just means we're having a problem that we have to solve. And that's why we're communicating. Right. And then when we're talking about it, eventually you get to solve the problem. Right. Um, it's how we do that. Right. And we forget that active listening is part of communication. Mm. Right. So active listening means if you're yelling and screaming, it's too late. You're already in a fight. Mm. If you're interrupting somebody else, you've stopped listening. And if you're thinking of the next thing to say, you have also stopped listening. Very true. So I did hear someone say once, repeat everything I've just said. How do you feel about that? If, they, if they're having an argument and then they say, okay, what did I just say to you? How do you feel about that? I think you have to be really careful. Yeah. Um, that works better with children. It could be condescending. Yeah in your adult love relationships, uh, depending on how you're able to communicate that with the other person, right? Um, my hope is that the person who's on the receiving end can say, um, you know, I just want to know if I'm hearing you correctly, is this what you mean? Right? So these are, when we talk about being in our adult, why it's really important to learn how to express ourselves right? You know, boys actually disconnect from their feelings around age five. Oh, wow. Yes, they disconnect their head from their heart because of the messaging they get. Um, we don't raise relational men. So now all of a sudden, they're expected in love relationships to know how to feel and how to express themselves. But they got these messages that said, you got to be tough and you can't cry and, you know, don't be a sissy. So there's all these different messages. And women, it's acceptable for them to emote all over the place. Right. Right. So you know, nobody teaches us what's the middle ground of those, those emotions and how do we regulate them, right, without being afraid of them. Um, you know, we're filtering our emotions thousands and thousands of times a day, hmm. right? And so why don't we need to do that in our relationships? You wouldn't go to work and, you know, and speak to your boss that way. So you can regulate your emotions. What happens when you come home? Right. What gives you the right to do that on your partner and, you know, in an uncomfortable way? Mm. Right. So we have to have boundaries around how we treat ourselves and how we are with others. And one more thing with regards to uncomfortable feelings. What if someone, you know, when uncomfortable moments happen, human behavior changes and you may do something that like I'm going to use the example of eat. So you may go to the fridge because all of a sudden you're, you know, you know, you're faced with something you have to deal with that you're not comfortable with. Is that something that like a, a human behavior that some people do end up moving towards? <laughs> of course. So some of the, we call them DRBs, right? Distress reducing behaviors. Oh. 
And, and this is why therapy is so great because you can get curious about yourself. What are my distress reducing behaviors? So you so am I an emotional eater? Mm -hmm. So when I'm, you know, stressed out, what happens to me? You know, I remember, you know, years and years ago, um, uh, I think I watched an Oprah episode and they were talking about emotional eating. And then I had this argument with my mom at the time and I hung up the phone and I opened the pantries in my, in my kitchen. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm an emotional eater. And uh, you know, and so from there on, I could recognize, okay, I'm not going to use that as, you know, one of my negative coping strategies, right? So withdrawal is a negative coping strategy, being reactive is a negative coping strategy. Over drinking can be an, you know, a coping strat, a negative coping strategy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's so many things people can do, um, and it's recognizing that okay, is that helpful to me or is that hurtful to me? And if I have these negative coping strategies, um, that's a great way to go get some help and say, okay, let me create new habits, healthy mindset practice new things and, you know, and gain the confidence uh, because what happens in our love relationships, we will create and co-create things that we were role modeled, mm. right? Where's our first love relationship? Where do we learn about relationships through our parents? Right. right. So if they had, you know, a nurturing relationship, you may learn some of those skills. If they had reactive relationship, you're going to learn some of those skills and make no mistake, you know, relationships are just a mirror of our unresolved childhood issues. And there's this subconscious magnetic attraction to the person that we're with, not by accident, that we have to work through. Right. And they're just a reflection for us to learn more things about ourself. Mm -hmm what triggers you within their behavior. Yes. So triggers are the situation that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. It activates or, you know, evokes those feelings. It wakes them up and then sets off that chain of events. Mm -hmm. And it's usually connected to a familiar feeling from a long time ago. That's why we have conflict because it's like, oh, there's that feeling again. Which is suppressed most likely. It might be suppressed. Maybe you know about it and you've done nothing with it. Right. <laughs> right. And now you're in this situation, um, you know, or in a partnership that, um, you know, you have to deal with it because you can't keep reacting the same way because it could be harmful to the relationship. Interesting. And this is where therapy helps. <laughs> Well, and, and knowing some of this before you get into, you know, a life partnership or a marriage, mm. um, it's so critical because then, you know, you would know your partner intimately and psychologically. Right. When you do that, then, you know, it's, you're not going to be so fearful. You're going to understand where those things are coming from. So you would say, oh, I know that's in my partner's history. Um, so why would I do something to be mean and hurtful to that person by, you know, throwing it in their face or using that as, you know, a weapon to hurt the other person, right? And people have to be very cautious of those things because you know what, we get into some bad habits and, you know, and subconsciously create those patterns, um, you know, that become perpetual problems in our, in our relationships. If you do have a partner that, and you recognize a, a trigger within them and you know that's something they need to work through, do you mention it? to them or do you let them discover it on their own don't you dare mention it when you're having a conflict <laughs> okay. okay no uh, but what you can do when you know things are nice and stable in the relationship you know when when things calm down remember that delayed conversation that we mm -hmm. said we were going to have that's when you might notice right it hurts me when you do this and i notice that it happens often can we talk about it some more mm -hmm. So now it's going to be less confrontational, right? Now we've made a repair in the relationship. So we're sort of in a better place to, you know, talk about that um, issue. You know, what happens if every time we have a conflict, um, that person reaches for a bottle of wine, mm -hmm. right? That could be problematic. 
And so that's why it's important to know prior to getting into long-term relationships or as we embark on these journeys, what are our values? Have we talked about those things? Are we compatible? Yeah. Right? Or else you're going to have a lot of conflict. Right. Well, there are so many topics we could talk about and I could keep you all afternoon before we end uh, yeah. off. <laughs> And I love what you've given so far to the audience. I think it's so helpful and I think it's needed. Um, but what other advice do you have for anyone who is planning right now to keep it as harmonious? And obviously you've given a lot of tips up to this point, but to keep it harmonious as possible uh, as they move forward. <sighs> one, one of the things I, I would say is, again, I just want to reiterate being kind, loving and respectful in your approach. Mm. A lot of times, if we have a harsh approach, you're going to feel that, right? It's going to be abrupt. You're going to be dismissive. If you have a softer approach when you're having these conversations with your partner or with other family members, you're going to have much better results because you're going to be considerate. You're going to be, you know, recognizing the other person. So those insecure feelings don't come to the surface and you won't have the need or they won't have the need to control the situation. Right. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Mary, I want to thank you for your time today. This has been absolutely fantastic. I hope that there have been so many takeaways for everyone listening. And uh, if you want to contact Mary, where do they find you, Mary? Uh, so you can type in my name, Mary Morano, and I come up all over the place. Um, or you can go to our website at lifeandfamilycounseling.com. I'm on Instagram. Um, yeah, and easy to access me. Amazing. Well, thank you for everything you do because repairing relationships or working through them before they even get started is very important, very important for our society uh, moving forward. So absolutely. Thank you for everything. And hopefully we'll see you again sometime soon. Absolutely. Remember relationships are the meat of life, right? And so take care of your relationships. And I really appreciated our time together today. episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please feel free to comment below what your biggest takeaway was when it comes to family dynamics and wedding planning. As always, I want to thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next week on the VIP Collective.